Okay, uh, we are live. Um, hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I didn't publish a title or for this broadcast today because uh, I, I think I'm going to go a little bit more on a spontaneous uh, um, system here. Uh, there, there are several things that we've been studying, and uh, each day we may just spontaneously decide which subject matter to discuss that day. And Brother Eric and I were, were discussing, we decided we wanted to continue with our study of Job today. Uh, yesterday we talked about Proverbs, and uh, so we'll, we'll begin, a, begin the, the book of John here very soon and some other interesting subjects. And, and, uh, but for, for now, now we're going to pick up where we left off last time on the book of Job. Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Job chapter 18. But first, let me ask Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, uh, hello, everybody. It's me again, the whole mo. And what? What? Hey. <laughs> Okay, the Lone Ranger's in the house. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. <laughs> okay. Well, Brother, you can't really call yourself the Lone Ranger because even even if I'm not with you, you're never alone. You've, it's always you and the Holy Spirit, right? You're inseparable. So, okay. Well, uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. All right, let's go on with... Uh, I'm going to... Uh, since I'm a KJV first, just I'll read uh, the chapter 18 in the KJV, and then I'm going to go through it more slowly in the Amplified, and we're, then we'll discuss it. But uh, here's the uh, chapter 18, book of Job. Then answered Bill Dead and, and the Shumite and said, How long will it be ere ye make an end of words? Mark, and afterwards we will speak. Wherefore are we counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? He teareth himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee? And shall the rock be removed out of his place? Yea, the, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walketh upon a snare. The gin shall take him by the heel, and the robber shall prevail against him. The snare is laid for him in the ground, and a trap for him in the way. Terror shall make him afraid on every side, and shall drive him to his feet. His strength shall be hunger bitten, and destruction shall be ready at his side. He shall devour the strength of his skin, even the firstborn of death shall devour his strength. His confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle, and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. He shall dwell in his tabernacle, because it is none of his brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation his roots shall be dried up beneath and above shall his branch be cut off his remembrance shall perish from the earth and he shall have no name in the street he shall be driven from the, from light into darkness and chased out of the world he shall neither have son nor nephew among his people nor any remaining in his dwellings they that come after him shall be astonished at his day, as they that went before were affrighted. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. Well, I think we'll, uh, we certainly got the gist of it there. Uh, we'll go, I think we'll understand it better as we go through it slowly in the Amplified, but uh, uh, you're... you're of course, this is one of his three so-called friends that, uh, that, that that keeps on condemning Job, and this is pretty heavy, heavy, cruel things he's saying here. What's your reaction to that chapter? 
Well, Brother Luke, uh, to be honest with you, I would have to uh, agree with uh, Bill Dad, the shoe height. Uh, because uh, from what I've learned in scriptures about uh, the man of this world, that man of sin, the son of perdition, and his office and uh, what will befall him, uh, especially uh, chapter uh, 109 in the book of Psalms, uh, it tells about him. And uh, he's the head of all these wicked people. And uh, the Bible says what's going to happen to him. It sounds a lot like what Bildad's saying. And so apparently uh, Job is undergoing things that uh, only uh, the wicked should have to endure. And so they're really laying it on him thick because they're really convinced that uh, he's culpable. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, um, the, the thing that we've seen going on now for several chapters is uh, Job, Job expressing how he feels and his friends in the next chapter expressing how they feel. And, 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 and Job is basically trying to defend himself, and saying that... Uh, I, I don't think this is, is happening because I've, I've sinned. I mean, I, I, I haven't done anything wrong. And his friends are saying, no, it's you, and you deserve it. And God's doing it to you. And they're going back and forth. One chapter is Job. The next chapter is his friend. And it, uh, I, I think that everything they said there, oh, okay, sure, that, that applies to um, uh, people who, who are evil and, and uh, uh, describes you know, the works of, of the devil. As you say, but it's um, the the misunderstanding is that Job deserves all this because he's an evil person. He's done something wrong, and he needs to repent. So I think that's that's how I my reaction to this chapter here and his friend's speech. I think he's a, it's a speech against Job, not just broadly against evil people. Um, but I'm going to go into it more slowly here. But what's your response to that? Absolutely, Brother Luke. Uh, I agree with that 100%. Okay, back to you. Uh, and, and for those people watching this video now who have not watched the previous videos on Job, uh, here we are in chapter 18, so we've had 17 chapters already. I hope you will go back and watch those videos uh, so you can understand the whole context of what's happened here. Um, uh, his friends and even Job himself are not uh, privy to to what happened in the first one and two chapters, where Satan is going before God and and, and uh, saying that uh, God asked him, "Have you considered my servant Job?" Um, because Satan is arguing that all men are are horrible, and and God says, "Well, what, what about Job? Uh, Job's a righteous man," and and uh, uh, Satan says, "Well, you." The only reason he's uh, he loves you is because he has so much. You blessed him. He's got wealth and family and health. Everything everything is great. If you let me take all those things away from him, then you'll see that he'll curse you and hate you. Uh, so that's the experiment that is going on. God allows it, but God is not doing it to him. He's but he is letting Satan do it to him, and it's not because Job deserves it and he's evil and he he's, deserves all these bad things. No, it's he, he, he's not a, a sinner that's being uh, suffering the consequences of sin. So that's the thing you need to understand in context before we go on. Now let me go now verse by verse uh, through this. I'm going to read in the Amplify because it, it amplifies, it expounds a little bit. Uh, and Amplified has a title for the chapter. And the title is Bildad speaks of the wicked. It says, Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you hunt for words and continue these speeches? Do some, do some clear thinking and show understanding, and then we can talk. Uh, so b before we go on, uh, you know, that... He's basically saying what, how we just kind of summarize this. Job's making a speech in his defense, 
And then the, the friends make a speech basically against Job. And so uh, he asks Job, he says, do some clear thinking and show understanding and then we can talk. Verse three says, why are we regarded as beasts? And this, and as if we are stupid, senseless in your eyes. Uh, it seems that, doesn't it seem that, uh, you know, his friends are offended because, because they're, they're, they believe that uh, Job is, is, uh, is, sees them as being stupid because they don't understand. But and the, the truth is, Job's, Job's right. They don't understand. Uh, Job understood when he said in an earlier chapter, he says, my, my sins, God has already sold them, put them in a bag and sewn up the bag. I mean, God, Job understands that um, the love, forgiveness, and mercy of God because it is faith in God. So this idea of our sins uh, and, uh, and, and um, resolving the sin problem be, through faith in God, this is not just a New Testament idea. It goes back in the Old Testament and... Uh, Job has expressed it. The only thing out of Job's uh, message, of statement of, of faith there is there's no Jesus because Jesus hasn't come on the scene yet. Uh, later on, as we learn more about God's plan, we understand that the way God's going to put those sins in a bag and sew them up is through the cross. He'll send his son to die for our sins. Job knows that God's going to forgive his sins because of his faith in God, but he doesn't, he's not privy to the, the gospel as we know it. Brother? That's just great news, Brother Luke. So Job is standing on the rock of his salvation, Jesus Christ, even before Jesus Christ came to the earth. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Okay, so now let's go listen to more of Bill Dad's speech here. Um, verse 4, you who tear yourself apart in anger, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake or the rock to be moved out of its place? Indeed, the light of the wicked will be put out and the flame of his fire will not shine. Uh, I noticed that the Amplified translators, they title this that uh, Bill Dad speaks of the wicked. But uh, the way I see it is that he's speaking of the wicked in general, but he's also pointing the finger at Job as and, and, and following the same line of thinking that all the bad things are happening because you're wicked. You've done something wicked. You need to identify what it is and repent and, and uh, ask God for mercy. Uh, but... Uh, so this is, this is not just broad, general talk about the evil people, in my opinion. What do you think, brother? Absolutely, uh, Brother Luke. Uh, once again, uh, Job is uh, carrying the weight of all that iniquity and uh, being blamed for it. Uh, is Job a picture of Christ, uh, would you say? Um, I don't see Job as a picture of Christ. If you, if you see it, maybe you can explain um, how that is so. I, I see him a picture of, of, of us, of a believer, an example of a believer before the cross, um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a big disagreement within Christendom about um, what, what we call dispensationalism. I have a playlist titled Dispensationalism, Millennialism, so I forgot, but Dispensationalism is the beginning of the title. Uh, I also have another playlist titled Paul Onlyism Debunked, and I talk a lot about uh, this hyper-dispensationalism. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there is a faction of people that believe bef before the cross uh, that 
God dealt with people differently as far as salvation. He had a different set of rules or requirements or a method for them to get saved, uh, different than what we have. And, 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 and there were some kind of uh, system that they had to believe and, and follow and, and, and works were factored into it. Your works uh, were part of a formula. That's how dispensationalists see this times before the cross. But I don't see it that way. I'm not a dispensationalist. Um, I, I just see one division in the scriptures, and that's the cross. Before the cross and after the cross. Everything before the cross looks forward to God solving man's sin problem. Uh, and then after the cross, we look back and say, God solved our sin problem. He sent his son. He died for our sins. So that's the only dividing point that I see in the Bible. And, and that's what the Bible says. It's, it's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The book of Hebrews says the testament begins with the death of the testator. So when Jesus died, then the New Testament begins. Uh, but uh, I see that uh, Job got saved the same way we did. He relied on God to save him. He just trusted God to, that God would deal, will deal with him with mercy and love and forgiveness. He trusted God. He didn't, and he even understood that his sins, God put him in a bag. God was forgiving. Uh, so he was not trying to get, get there through personal merit or through some kind of religious system. It was by the grace of God, through faith in God. But, but the difference between Job and me is that I know more now because now we've seen things, history has played out, and the plan of salvation has been executed when Jesus was executed. And so uh, Job relied on God, but he didn't know who he was and what he was going to do specifically. I know who he is. He's Jesus Christ. And what he did was he died for our sins and he raised himself from the dead. So I, I see Job not as a, uh, a picture of Christ, but a, a picture of, of salvation through grace and faith. Absolutely, Brother Luke. So the difference uh, is not in dispensations, but rather in categorizations, whereas when the Old Testament, God is dealing with national Israel. Uh, in the New Testament, God is dealing with the individual. Now, God dealt with the individual the same way as he always has. The only difference between us and Job is Job didn't know the name of Jesus, at least the spoken name. He knew the unspoken name of Jesus, perhaps. What do you think about that? Um, well, he, you're right. That's a great way of, of expressing it because uh, Job believed that God saves. Jesus' name literally translates to God saves. So he believed in Jesus, but I mean, if, if you told him, Job, do you believe God saves? God will, will save you. He'll say, yeah, I, I trust God. And, and so when he says, I believe God saves, that's the same as I believe Jesus. All right, I'll move on to the next verse, unless you have anything you want to add to that. Go right ahead, Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, verse 5 is, indeed, the light of the wicked will be put out, and the flame of his fire will not shine. The light will be dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him will be put out. The vigorous stride will be shortened, and his own counsel and the scheme in which he trusted will bring his downfall. For the wicked is thrown into a net by his own feet, wickedness. And he steps on the webbing of the lattice-covered pit. Um, it's um, the thing that I find really interesting about Job's so-called friends is their eloquence, um, their their conclusions, their doctrine is off, 
they don't understand that what Job, God and salvation, the, the way Job does and the way that we do, uh, uh, they and, and they they don't understand what's happening happened to Job correctly either, uh, but what they believe they express eloquently. I mean, isn't it beautifully written and stated what they're saying? And yet, it doesn't apply to Job in that way. Absolutely, brother Luke. It almost reminds me of my own uh, lawyers and such. What it, what it reminds me of is a video that I made titled Lordship Salvation Liars. And I don't usually like to, I, when I condemn things that are wrong, I, I usually like to stick strictly to doctrine and issues rather than people, personalities. But there are a handful of really famous theologians today that were, they're so renowned and so influential that they had to be named. So I, I singled out people like John MacArthur, John, John Piper, Paul, Paul Washer, um, and, and, and some others as Lordship Salvation Liars. And one of the main points I was making is that don't let their eloquence win you over. It's not, it's not the, the um, beauty of their speech, their delivery, their uh, uh, that that should be make you uh, make you believe in their argument. Go by what they say and compare it to the scriptures. Uh, even Paul stated at one point. He says, "I don't have beauty of speech, you know, uh, and I do better when I write a letter because because." Uh, you know, uh, when I get, I'm there in person, I'm not very impressive. I mean, he was not a physically impressive person. He wasn't great at speech, I guess. Uh, and according to him, he was better writing out his, his theology. Uh, but too many people are there overly impressed with eloquence, uh, oratory. And, and that's what I'm seeing from Job's friends here. It, uh, a person could read Job, and if they don't understand it, the way that we're explaining it here, they could say that, boy, Bill Job's friends are, man, that's, that's really powerful stuff they're saying there. I mean, and think that it's truly applying to them. Brother? Uh, I agree with you, Brother Luke. It almost seems like Job's friends are uh, work salvationists, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, except for uh, a few people throughout the scriptures that we, we see really got it right, the rest of the world, of all of mankind, seemed like the default theology that mankind automatically reverts to is the merit system. Uh, look at all the religions in the world that, that exist, and every one of them is based on the merit system, except for Christianity. And I'm saying Christianity because Christianity is based on trusting Christ to save you. And Christianity in most denominations and sects, the way people think of their Christianity, is they still think that they go to heaven through personal merit if they're good enough. So uh, it, it just seems like that's the way man thinks. And I think Brother uh, Neo, uh, yesterday or whenever he was on with us recently, uh, he, he was talking about that. Uh, that's just kind of like the natural way man thinks that man, man thinks in a way of, uh, uh, it just doesn't seem right to get a free gift. It seems like you got to work for it and earn it. And I've told people, some people I've had to repeat this over and over and over and over again, over the years, they don't understand that heaven is not a reward. Heaven's a gift. Man thinks that. You go to heaven as a reward for your good good behavior. Uh, so that's just the way man thinks. Man, the idea of that God is, is that's not in Romans ten three. It says that God that's not God's way. Establishing your own righteousness, going to heaven that way, that's not God's way. 
God's way is trusting in Jesus and his righteousness, his works. And it's a kind of a foreign idea to people. It doesn't, it seems like it's too easy. It's too simple, but that's what, that's what Jesus, John, Peter, Paul, that's what the scriptures tell us though. That's the way he said, my yoke is easy. Okay. Uh, anything before I go on to the next verse? Uh, I agree, Brother Luke. It's foolish pride. And they think that they can be good enough to earn God's favor. And that's just uh, not so according to scriptures. Okay, go ahead. Okay, let me, let me go on. Um, okay, a verse... Um, I think I'm on verse nine. A snare catches him by the heel, and a trap a trap snaps snaps shut on him. A noose is hidden for him on the ground, and a trap for him on the path. Terrors frighten him on every side and chase at his heels. The strength of the wicked is famished and weakened, and disaster is ready at his side if he stops. Now this is getting now he's getting it really personal in verse 13. He says, his skin is devoured by disease. <laughs> we know that's one of the things that happened to Job. He he got boils on his body from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And so this friend Bill Dad is talking about evil people, the things that happened to him. And, and there, to me, there's no, it could not be misunderstood. He, he's not talking only about evil people in general, but this is personal. It's a personal attack against Job. His skin is devoured by disease. The firstborn of death, the worst of diseases, consumes his limbs. He is torn from his tent, which he trusted for safety. And he is marched and brought to the king of terrors, death. Hmm. Brother, I hope I never have friends. I mean, I, sh I, act I think I spoke too soon. Uh, I'm sad to say I, I have had friends like Bill Dad. I hope I never have any more friends like that because they're cruel. There is no compassion, no sympathy, no empathy. All there is is finger pointing and condemnation. Uh, we got Brother Neil here. Let's say hi to him. And uh, Hi, Neil. What's up? Glad you joined us. Yeah, I'm, uh, I was listening a little bit here, and then I uh, popped in for a second. Sorry I had to leave uh, yesterday or the day before, and uh, every time I come in, something pops up. <laughs> well, Brother, uh, you, you're welcome to join as long or as shortly as, 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 as you deem uh, you can. It's uh, uh, even if you're here for a few minutes, it's always nice to talk to you. Uh, so, uh, have you have you listened much to the study of Job, the first 17 chapters we did, and now we're in chapter 18? Yeah, yeah. No, I listened to some of your videos on YouTube. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, from what we've been talking about today, do you have anything you want to say before we go on? Yeah. Um... Whenever we get time, maybe later, uh, I wanted to ask you a question that's probably inappropriate for Bible study talk about uh, atheism and agnosticism and how they're compatible or not. Okay, well, we can talk about that uh, after we end the live broadcast. I'll talk to you briefly, and if, if, if we feel that it might be helpful, maybe we can do a, an entire live broadcast on that uh, if there's enough subject matter. But for now, let's just hold it till the live broadcast is over. I'm going to continue reading. What we have is Bill Dead, you know, uh, really uh, condemning uh, wicked people, and he thinks Job is one of them. It says, uh, um, let me see. 
What verse was I on? Uh, I'll go with 17. Memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name on the street. He is driven and propelled from light into darkness and chased from the inhabited world. Oh, no, I missed a verse here. I'm going to go to verse 15. Nothing in his of his dwells in his tent. Brimstone, burning sulfur, is scattered over his dwelling to purify it. The roots of the wicked are dried up below and above. His branch is cut off and withers. Memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name on the street. Um, so, well, let me ask you, Brother Neil, I've, I've talked a little bit about, as we've been going through this ordeal with Job's suffering and his so-called friends, how they are not being helpful. Instead, they're being condemning and judgmental. And I've complained that, uh, unfortunately, I've had friends like that. And, and uh, I, hope, I hope I don't have any more friends like that in the future. But, but have you ever experienced that kind of condemnation from people that when you're suffering, something's going wrong in your life, and you have friends that instead of giving you encouragement and, and uh, tr trying to be helpful, they're just pointing the finger and condemning you? Oh, yes, definitely. That happens once in a blue moon, not very often, but yeah. Yeah, uh, it, you're right. It, I don't want to give people the idea that, you know, every friendship is like that, but uh, yeah, there are friends like that. And and uh, I, I've said this before, and I, I don't want people to think that, I mean, I, I love the brethren, but I, I've had a harder time getting along with uh, professing Christians than I have anybody else in my life. Um, I, I've got some lifelong friends from, you know, my youth and in college days, and they're still friends of mine. And, you know, my theology is no secret to them. I tell them about it. I witness to them. And, but they're not, they're not uh, Christians as we are, where they want to study the Bible and talk about Jesus all the time. Our relationships, uh, our conversations are generally about other subject matter. And we, we get along fine. We don't have all these conflicts. But, but uh, many of the people that uh, I've, I've met through Christianity it's so hard to get along with them because they, uh, they're like this, these people here, and, and they just want to pick people apart and find fault. I have a video titled uh, Nitpickers, Fault Finders, Nat Strainers, and, and so I, I have encountered people like that. Yeah, I'll add to that. Uh, it, when you said self-professed Christians, I think that right there is kind of an alarm, a discerning factor for me somebody self-professes themselves to be a Christian, I mean, it's just in my position, I don't go around saying I'm a Christian. I say I believe in Jesus Christ. If you want to label me a Christian, that's fine. But I'm, like, I'm not going to go out there saying, well, I'm a Christian and you're not, or whatever it is. <laughs> or I believe more in Christianity than you do. That's just, I think it's, it becomes a bad word over time. You keep forcing the word Christianity on everybody. And, you know. Yeah, well, actually, uh, that inter interesting how you uh, you made me think of uh, that study that we done we did last week about uh, terminology and words, and I, I think I had probably about you know ten or fifteen words and terms that I talked about that are um, misunderstood and, and uh, misapplied uh, commonly, and uh, and, and th this is one of those words. Uh, isn't it sad? That the word Christianity and and the the, um, the the title Christian it can't even be trusted anymore because because if the vast majority of people who uh, identify themselves as a Christian of some kind the vast majority of them they don't believe in the Christianity we find in this Bible they believe in some other kind of Christianity that's not based on the Bible at all and uh, so that's a word Christian that's why I've I've made an effort over the years maybe you've noticed but uh, I, I I emphasize Christ in the word I, I say Christianity I say uh, I'm a Christian because his name is not Christ unless you're talking Greek and say Christos 
but in English we pronounce his name as Christ. So it's Christianity because I want him elevated. I want him to be the focal point, not the kind of Christianity where I'm the center of it, where it's all based upon me and my performance. Uh, we'll go back onto Job, but I'll get your let me get your reaction to that, each of you. Eric. Oh, I'm just so glad that you're back here today, Neil. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And uh, uh, so far, so good uh, on this discussion about Job and his uh, friends, so-called friends. And uh, as far as uh, terminology, uh, Christianity and all the words that the enemy has stolen and is... Uh, well, we're going to get it all back. Uh, I'm certain of that. As soon as Jesus Christ puts his left foot back down on the earth, uh, we're going to get all that back. Okay, back to you. Amen for that, brother. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you, Luke. And uh, That's what I was going to say. You were saying uh, uh, that it, it doesn't matter our knowledge of the Bible. I mean, see, I, my pastor did say that, but then he corrected himself in a way. But I don't, our interpretation or how good our interpretation is, isn't really the focal point. The focal point is Jesus, not how good our interpretation is. It's not about me and how good I can interpret it for you. It's about Christ. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, so I, I find that the when I'm talking about Bildad and, and his, he's, what he's saying here, uh, I said earlier that he's very eloquent. It's a very powerful speech he's making against wickedness, and then specifically about Job being one of them. Uh, it's powerful. But uh, it, 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 the, the person that is saying that kind of a thing uh, is the, today, and when we come coming forward into contemporary time now, it's the, the kind of person that does that are the people that really get into the Bible. And unfortunately, it, it, I, I'm really saddened by a lot of the, the things that I see in a Christendom in the world today. I don't know how long it's been like that. We'll study church history in a, another, uh, another time. But the way I see it today is that the people who start studying the Bible, it doesn't take very long at all for them to start forming all kinds of dogmas and then dividing over their dogmas. And as, as I've said many times, uh, the dogma that we really need to have is the dogma on the person and works and sufficiency of Christ. And, uh, you know, he's God, he's, he's our, we're saved through faith in him without any works required, and we have eternal security. That, that I'll be dogmatic as, as much as anybody else is dogmatic. But uh, the problem is, as people start studying the scriptures, they start forming a hundred other dogmas. And uh, they, they, these people are extremely hard to get along with. Um, all right, I'll go to the next verse. Um, um, verse 19, he has no offspring or prosperity among his people, nor any survivor where he sojourned. Those in the west are astonished and appalled at his fate, and those in the east are seized with horror. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked and the ungodly, and such is the place of him who does not know or recognize or honor God. All right, um, before we go on to the next uh, chapter here and get Job's response to this, what's your, you know, let me see if I get any reaction from you guys. I'm good. Okay, I'm going to read the next chapter. I'll read it in the KJV. And then I suspect that we'll get the gist of it, and I'll probably need the Amplified to 
go into it more deeply. So the KJV verse 19, uh, it says, Then Job answered and said, How long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times have ye reproached me. Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourself strange to me? And be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remaineth with myself. If indeed ye will magnify yourselves against me, and plead against me my reproach, know now that God hath overthrown me, and hath compassed me with his net. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he hath set darkness in my paths. He hath stripped me of my glory, and taken the crown from my head. He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and mine hope hath he removed like a tree. He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he counteth me unto him as one of his enemies. His troops come together and raise up the, their way against me and encamp round about my tabernacle. He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are very estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They have, they that dwell in mine house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. Yea, young children despise me. I arose, and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do ye persecute me as God, and are not satisfied with my flesh? O oh, that my words were now written, Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, and though my reins be consumed within me. But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? But ye if, be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. Wow. Uh, I don't think we even have to use the Amplified in, that, in this particular chapter. It was very, very clear to me what he was saying there. But there's a couple of verses that just like slapped me in the face, that were just like, just blew me away. It's kind of like the verse we found a few chapters back where Job said, God has taken my sins and put them in a bag and sewed it shut. That verse blew me away. A few chapters ago, uh, and and uh, and there's a couple of verses here. But before I tell you what stood out to me, let me ask you to re reply. What stood out to you in that chapter? There. You know, Brother Luke and Neil, uh, you're absolutely right, Brother Luke. Uh, Job said those special words that revealed his true relationship with God when he said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. 
And I'm certain those are the verses that you uh, are have in mind. Okay, back to you guys. Yeah, brother Neil. Yeah, you know it. Uh, the whole material world fell apart in front of Job. Pretty much he, himself included. Everything fell apart. Uh, you know, he was felt like he was gonna die. So I mean, that's that point where, like, to, so to say, you're at the bottom of the barrel, or you've hit rock bottom. You know, I guess that that could be where the saying would come in. Like, you know, that's everything's been taken away, and all this stuff is happening. So, as we know later on, what happens in the in the scripture, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I, I love Job a lot because he shows that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what happens to you, you can still believe. Uh, these uh, studies are, on, and most of the studies I'm doing in these hangouts, are a series. Uh, it takes a long time to get through over 40 chapters in the book of Job. It, it, by the time we're finished it, it may be six months or a year to get through the whole thing. And, and then there's there's other times where I do a study and, and just one hour and you've covered it and that's it and you've, you've been thorough and you're done. But because of this as a series, I find myself, uh, I have to keep repeating myself because I, I, I realize that some people are going to watch a video and they didn't see all the videos before that led up to it and they don't have the right context. So I, I think that it's necessary to, to give co some context to this again. And that is that the big surprise to most people will be that, number one, Job doesn't even understand what's happening to him. Job was not at the meeting between Satan and God in the first couple of chapters. He doesn't know about that. He's not privy to it. He, he originally was defending himself, saying that he doesn't, hasn't done anything wrong. He, he, he's righteous, and, and, he, and he's not being punished. And, it, and, and, and then eventually he gets swayed by his so-called friends and he, and he starts saying well I think it maybe I have done something wrong and he's confessing again here a little bit about that that um, he's being punished he believes that he's being punished by God but he's not God's not doing it to him Satan is God is permitting it but God is not doing it as a punishment because he have, because of Job's sin so his friends are wrong about accusing Job and Job is even wrong when he finally kind of just says, it must be, they must be right, I must be being punished by God. So that's the first thing you need to understand to get the context here. Um, but one thing that really stood out to me here that is, is not even relevant to the whole subject, but, but it, it stood out like a, like it went off like a big rocket. And, uh, and that is uh, verse 26. Eric, Eric mentioned it, and it says, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now, what could he possibly be thinking about there? He's talking about the resurrection of the dead, soon to come. Job believed in a bodily resurrection. That's to, that, that's the important thing to get from that. That this idea of a bodily resurrection is ancient. It's not some new concept that happened only uh, in the in the time of Jesus. And that uh, even in Jesus, he, there was a group called the Sadducees that rejected the idea of a bodily res resurrection. And uh, but. We can we we see that I, I'm sure that maybe even earlier we can find um, references to it. I've never really tried to seek out and see what's the earliest references to the resurrection, but this might be the earliest reference 
the, uh, unless someone can give me one earlier, I, I would think this might be the earliest reference to a bodily resurrection. Job saying that he knows that even after he dies and the worms eat away his body, he will see God in his flesh. Uh, and the other thing that stood out to me is verse 23. He says, Oh, that my words were, writ were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Thank you, Jesus, that we have this book of Job uh, uh, saved. It's, it's been uh, preserved so that we have it. Job's desire has been fulfilled. It was written in a book. It's been preserved after all these centuries. And, 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 and we benefit from it. Now, that gets me to the first question I asked seven, 18 chapters ago. And I'll ask it again. But why in the world do you think God even agreed to let Satan do this? Why did all this happen to Job? What is the real purpose of this experience and this book? You know, I remember you asking that question, and I remember deferring that question to my lawyers, but I don't remember what the answer was. <laughs> Does Brother Neil have an opinion on that? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Uh... There is a couple different ways to, not different ways, but um, uh, what I said was just like the beginning. You said what I would have said at the end of it. But yeah, it's it, there's a lot of stuff going on with Job that uh, points to kind of a redeemer. I guess the word I would use, or he he feels like he's going to be redeemed somehow, or like you said, resurrected. And he didn't even know about Jesus Christ or anything. So, but uh, he did know some things. He knows that his Redeemer, you know, whatever lives. But I don't think he knew the context of what that meant. And you know, yeah. Uh, well, were you listening when? Uh, I was telling Brother Eric about um, how I saw salvation in, in the book of Job and in times past uh, and compared to today and, and contrasting that with the, the, the popular dispensational viewpoint we find today. Did you hear what I said about that, Brother Neil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, just because... Uh, I may say one thing doesn't mean I, I disagree with a different viewpoint yet. No, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, well, a, a person, first of all, this is one of those a hundred things that a person doesn't have to agree upon, really. These, uh, whether people got saved differently in the past or they're going to get diff saved differently in the future, what really matters is that um, we all agree how we get saved today. Um, I, I, I've moved away from dispensationalism thinking that uh, in the past there was a different methodology for salvation and, and in the tribulation and millennial period it's going to be different again but today and only today it's by grace through faith alone and uh, so I, I, I've moved out of that camp and, I, and as I've said that I, it's always been by gr the grace of God through faith in God to save you but now we know that this God that saves us is named Jesus who died on the cross so, uh, um, but the, to me, I, the, my question was, what was the reason that this experience happened to Job? And what was the reason that Job wrote it down and we went and we, we get to read it today and, and what did we gain from it? My, uh, I've answered the question and Brother Bill answered it and he, he said there were basically three things that he came up with. I don't remember them all, but uh, to me, uh, God allowed all that to happen to Job 
so that Brother Neil and Brother Eric and Brother Luke here could all be talking about it and learning from this experience. That's why it was allowed to happen for our benefit so that we can reference it and say two things. One, look at the faith of Job. He even says here uh, in, in this speech, in this chapter, one of the main points that, that is, is made there is that his Redeemer liveth. And that was the verse that you cited, Brother Neil, as 25, I think. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Um, and through and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So even though Job has gone through all this suffering, and then on top of it, all the accusations from his so-called friends, and he's finally like so almost just crushed physically and mentally, and his faith is still strong. He hasn't lost his faith and his, his belief that God is re going to redeem him. Uh, and, and then also we have, from this book, we can have perspective. I got perspective. In, in 2014, I had a lot of health issues. I had three surgeries and all kinds of other complications. And for months, many months, I, I was going through this horrible ordeal. And it seemed like Every week I got a new complication and and people didn't realize what was going on in my mind because I put on a happy face but inside I was really suffering like well why aren't the prayers being answered I'm praying my friends everybody's praying for me and yet another problem another problem is it ever going to stop I was just like I, I never stopped loving God and believing God but I, I was just beaten down and just thought, is this ever going to end? And then when I was leaving the hospital for the last time, they're wheeling me out, and the person across the hall, I hear a conversation, a doctor went in there and said to them, we got the results from the tests, and you do have cancer. And they said, you can have chemo and radiation, but considering your age, you, you may not want to do it. And that was like Job hitting me in the face and giving me perspective. It's like saying, I, why don't I have any shoes? And then you meet the man who has no feet. So these are the things we get from Job, the understanding that let's keep our faith even in times of, uh, uh, where our faith is being so tested. And, and, and uh, uh, what a testimony it is to be able to praise God and love God at times like that. Anybody can praise Jesus when they're being blessed, and that's what Satan said. Satan, that was his argument to God. Oh, yeah, he praises you now. Let me beat him down, and he'll curse you. And that's what I ask everybody watching now. How are you going to deal with it? When you get beaten down, are you going to turn your back on God? If you do... You won't lose your salvation because Jesus says, uh, even when we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He can't deny himself means that, that he's promised you he's going to get you into heaven. And he can't break that promise. He can't deny him, himself. He's faithful. He's faithful to us even if we lose our faith. Uh, all right, brothers, we're going to make the, I'm going to make some closing remarks here, but let me give you a chance to respond to that, and then we'll, we'll end the live show. Absolutely, Brother Luke. And uh, like Neil said, no matter what befalls us, we can still trust in the Lord. And that's the hallmark of a true believer, because the new man inside us will never deny Jesus Christ. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Let's go over to Brother Neo here. Yeah, no, I love it, man. I love the Book of Job because I have been through a lot of suffering, like you were saying, in my lifetime. Uh, a lot of things like medical issues and motorcycle accidents and car accidents and whatever. Because I was young and stupid. But anyway, uh, 
the book of Job, you know, it, teach, it taught me that we can suffer for reasons that we don't understand. Sometimes we suffer for reasons we don't understand. And that's what faith is about. Even, even through things that we don't understand that's happening, to, to still have faith through those things is very powerful. Uh, it, makes, it makes God bigger in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, brother, you're, uh, do you mind telling us your age, or is that too personal of a question? No, oh, yeah, I'm in my mid thirties. Mid thirties? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so my son is thirty-five, and uh, I'm I'm very very proud of my son that he's so wise and so uh, accomplished at at such an age. And uh, that's the impression I'm getting from you is that you, you have a lot of wisdom for a young man. So I'm, I'm glad you could participate with us today. And anytime you you're, you're have the time free to do it, I'm, I hope you'll join us again. I, the last thing I want the audience to know is that you can learn a, a thousand things from studying the Bible, but the one thing that you must get right is this, this question. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Answer that question. Answer it right now. Now, if you said, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven, or I hope I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure, but I think I'm going to heaven. And the reason is because I'm a good person. And I, I, I follow the Ten Commandments, and I follow the Golden Rule, and I do attend church, and I do this. I, 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 I. If your answer is based upon your yourself, if if you're putting your faith in yourself, then you're not going to heaven. That's what Romans 10.3 teaches us, that uh, if, if you're putting your faith in your own righteousness, if you're trying to establish your own righteousness, thinking that I'm going to go to heaven as a reward for my good behavior, I do good, and God will let me into heaven. If that's what you believe, you're not going to heaven. You're going to go into the lake of fire and suffer the second death. And the most important thing we desire is that that's not where you go. We want you to have eternal life in heaven with us, with Jesus. And, and what do you have to do in order to get there? If you, can't, if you can't get there through personal merit, what do you do? Well, put your faith in Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul was asked by a, a jailer, Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? And, and Paul just said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And, and Jesus was asked the same question by the religious Jews. They said, what kind of works does God require of us? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on the one he sent. So if you want to please God, if you want to satisfy God, if you want to, if you want to reach a, a, a justified, righteous standing with God and be acceptable, the one thing you got to do, all that's required of you, the one thing you must do, you got to put your faith in Jesus instead of yourself. So I want you to know who he is. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is Savior because salvation comes only through him. He died for our sins on the cross, so your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Thank him for it. And he raised himself from the dead. That proves he has power over life and death. He does have the ability to give you life everlasting, and he is faithful. He keeps his promise. So put your faith in him, and you are guaranteed. You're promised from Jesus, our Savior God. You're promised eternal life in heaven. No matter what you do after that point, you're promised eternal life. All right, brothers, I'll let you say goodbye to everybody, and then we'll end the live broadcast. Goodbye, everybody. Love ya. <laughs> yes, goodbye to all our viewers. God bless in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you for participating, and viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.